Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our free webinar. We are going to talk about working with light. And in today's webinar, we're going to concentrate on making sure that uh, you get a ton of information about working with light from different angles, right? We are all photographers and we shoot a lot of different things. So um, we are going to talk about working with light with for nature photography, which is slightly different than if you're working with light with travel photography. And I'll, I'll explain why uh, throughout the presentation. And then we're gonna talk about working with light at home. We're gonna talk about working with light in post-processing. And then um, hopefully you'll get a sense of why light is such an important aspect of photography when you're trying to capture this great shots, like the one you see over here from uh, Volcanoes National Park. This particular image is, is fairly unique, and I'll tell you why. Um, it doesn't look very unique, but to capture it, you need to do quite a few things correctly. All right, so what's presentation? What's agenda on agenda today? So this is what's going to happen. We're going to do a short intro, which I'm doing right now, and then um, the order of presentation is, as you see over here, it's me, Ugo, Alan, Kate, Austin, and Padma. And uh, throughout the presentation, feel free to ask any questions. Now, as I mentioned, we are having a working with light workshop over the weekend. If you guys haven't signed up, you can sign up. If you are not able to attend live in person, no big deal. You will have access to this for about one year. So once we record the class, we'll put it up and within about 72 hours after the presentation, we'll give you access to it. And you can watch it at your own convenience. It's not gonna go away anywhere. Um, if you have any questions about any of those classes, please feel free to ask. All the material that we present today in our free webinar will be covered in a lot more detail in all of these classes. So uh, just, uh, Feel free to ask any questions if you have, and hopefully we'll make you curious enough to register for one or two of these. All right, so let's talk about light. What makes landscape photography different from other photography genres, right? Uh, say for example, portrait photography or um, even wedding photography. Well, one of the things you cannot do with landscape photography is you have absolutely no control of late in landscape photography. Um, even nature photography, wildlife photography, anything that you're doing outside, travel photography, you have no control of light. You have no control of weather. You have no control of people. Uh, you mean stuck in political rallies, motorcycle rallies. All of these things interfere with your ability to take photos. And light is one of those things that is always something that is out of your reach. So the question is, what we want when we take a landscape photography class or a nature photography class is the photo that you see on your left, which is this blazing skies in this gorgeous location in middle of nowhere. This is Death Valley National Park and you have perfect conditions. There's water on the ground and the salt formations are, are just incredible. And then you end up going to a location and you park your car and essentially you end up with a blue sky like the one that you see in the photo on the right. Now, a lot of people will say that in this case, all you have to do is just sit around and look at other people's photos on social media. But that is not true, right? It is not true at all. So in order to get over those conditions, of blue skies. First, you need to recognize what impacts light and colors and details. And that means that you have to know the type of light you're dealing with. So typically what you will learn in the webinar that's coming up is the different types of light. We're gonna talk about spotlight, we're gonna talk about front light, we're gonna talk about backlight. And each of these light conditions require a different skill set. I'll tell you, give you an example. For example, the backlight photo that you see with the reflections on the lake, which was taken in Banff in Canada, that required bracketing. 
It also required skills to blend those bracketed photos together to create the image that you see. Now, the spotlight conditions that you see in Death Valley on the photo on the left, that required me to get the exposure just right. So that sand that is being illuminated in the distance by a sharp, uh, like a intense beam of sunlight is not overexposed. But I also end up capturing all the details. Similarly, the front light required me to come up with an interesting composition so the image doesn't look flat. You should be able to see textures, colors, details in a front light situation, which typically is very, very flat when you try to photograph it, right? So you have to have a whole series of different skills. So if you can't control light, that means if you're gonna get light that landscape photography offers, which is say blue sky, what can you do about it? Well, the thing you have to do is you have to learn to see things differently. And you learn the workflow for landscape photography differently than you are learning to shoot, say a portrait photo, right? So let me give you some examples. So when you go and take a photo in a forest and it comes out like the one you see in right, you think, well, that's a really bad photo. Well, that's not quite true. The same forest and the similar lighting can produce a photo that is just like what you see on the right, right? Beams of sun coming down through the forest trees. Now, both of these photos were taken at 10 o'clock. This is not a blue hour photo, right? If you look at the sun, which is coming through, it was super high. Now, what happened was that I waited around for the fog to move in so that I could get the beams of sun to come through. And it moved in for 10 minutes and then it would disappear and they would move in again. So what you have to do with light is you have to see things differently. Instead of saying that, okay, I'm stuck with this harsh light at 10 o'clock at daytime and producing a snapshot, you have to think, what can I do with the harsh light and what conditions will produce the harsh light, which will produce brilliant photos like the one you see on the right side. Now, one of the things we do for landscape photography is when we are going in a forest, we will look for conditions to produce fog or mist, especially if you're near the coast. If you're in California, if you're in Hawaii, uh, check out the weather patterns and then figure out when mist is going to hang around and then go there in the forest. And your chances of getting beams like this are very, very high, right? So that's what we're going to talk about in Mastering Light class that I am talking about on Saturday. Now, the other thing you can control is your camera settings. So one of the very detailed explanation that we're gonna give you is how do you use your camera settings to capture the light that you see? And it is very different in different situations. So here's a, a screenshot from one of the videos that I'm gonna show you guys on Saturday, which is photographing Aurora. When you're photographing Aurora and you have a mirrorless camera, which a lot of you may have, what you're gonna find out is that it is so dark, especially if you go there on a, um, on a night without moon, that it is hard to see on back of your camera what you're trying to capture. Um, now, what you can do is there are settings in camera that you can turn on. Um, in my Sony camera, there's something called bright monitoring. And what bright monitoring does is um, it actually extends your exposure and slows down your frame rate so it captures more light and it allows you to see. But then you have to figure out, hey, I have all these trees in the foreground and these trees come pretty close. Where should I focus? Right. So when you're dealing with a really low light situation, you have to think about your camera settings is how do you compose? How do you focus? Um, what's your exposure like? So all of those things can be used to control the light that you're trying to capture. Now, this situation is very different when you're trying to capture 
the standing wave patterns. So the photo that you see on my right side over here is standing wave patterns on the rock. So if you ever look at the stream of water, you'll notice that there are waves on that form. And sometimes the waves look like they're stationary because they ripple in the same place. Now, if you go there on a sunny day, the waves will act like a lens. And when they act like a lens, they will create these wave patterns on it, right? So these standing wave patterns are what I captured in the photo with the stones. Now that required a really fast shutter speed. A why fast shutter speed? Well, what if I use a slow shutter speed? Well, those waves, they move around and they will blur out those edges that you see that creates this superb abstract photo. So that's one of the things that you can do is control your camera settings to capture the light that you're trying to work with. And we're gonna talk about how different camera settings will work in different situations to capture the light. All right, so let's go somewhere else. The other thing we're gonna learn about is how motion impacts light. You know, we landscape and nature photographers love the smooth flowing water. Now, when you're dealing with light and color, if you have too much motion, um, in your photo, sometimes the colors get lost. So these two photos were taken under similar conditions at the same location. This is Iceland. Um, the photo that you see where all the colors are blown, blurred out was taken with a really slow shutter speed. So the motion averaged out the light that you're trying to capture. And so what happened with motion averaging out the light is um, you notice that the colors in the geyser are gone. Now when I used a fast shutter speed as the geyser was exploding, I could capture those colors in perfect detail. So motion changes the dynamic range of the subject you're trying to capture. So you have to think that, hey, you don't have control over weather and the light, but you do have control over camera setting. Which camera setting is right to capture what you're trying to capture? So that is how we landscape photographers or nature photographers end up capturing what we envision, okay? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about those camera settings and then we're gonna talk about some advanced topics. So I told you I was gonna talk about this photo from Hawaii's Volcanoes National Park. So this is um, Kilauea, Kilauea Volcano in uh, Volcanoes National Park. This crater is right now no longer accessible because it collapsed and then it's sort of rebuilding itself. So it may be open now, although I haven't been there. But on the day we went there, one of the things that happens with light is if you have a source of light, for example, a crater which is glowing, then that glow is impacted by ambient light that you are trying to capture. So if you were to try to capture this glow of the crater and then you capture the clouds and the textures, they just will not work out. Because in order for you to capture textures in the cloud, the light has to be so high that the glow of the crater will almost be completely faded. So what I had to do is I had to take one shot, expose it for the clouds, then wait until the sun went down, it got darker, and then I got just enough light to expose for the glow that you see, the orange glow that you see on the mist that was hovering around the crater. And then I had to change my shutter speed and get a longer exposure to capture the smoke plumes that you see that were all around the crater. And they were making all kinds of swirls. So, what happened was this is called temporal bracketing. Um, a high speed bracketing is you take three shots to capture the light in one setting. Temporal bracketing requires you to capture light under different conditions. Now, that is an advanced topic of how we use light to create images that you see. Um, we're gonna talk about some of those advanced topics. Then there is something called scatter effect. So what's scatter effect? 
Scatter effect is found in um, areas where there is mist, there is water, um, any kind of high highlights of particles that are being scattered, you can actually find the scatter effect when you try to photograph Antelope Canyon, when you throw dust in the, in the air, right? So what the scatter effect does is, the light that is coming from the scatter effect depends on the density of the mist. So in this case, this is a blowhole in Maui that you see, and the water is just shooting up in the blowhole. And the light that is coming from the top is catching the mist and creating an overexposed area. All right, so that is what a scatter effect is. Scatter effect is how the light is scattered by the particles that you find in environment. Um, it could be your subject, it could be like background of your subject, it could be water that you're trying to photograph. And your camera settings will impact the scatter effect. So what we're gonna talk about is, if you find yourself in a situation like this, photographing waterfalls, photographing mist, photographing Antelope Canyon, um, how do you deal with capturing light, which is there, okay? So that's the next advanced topic. So this is what the agenda looks like for my class that's coming up. We'll talk about types of light, we'll talk about colors of light, which a lot of people are familiar with. And then we're going to present our available light workflow. What available light workflow will do is you'll be able to capture great photos in all conditions of light. Then we'll talk about camera settings, low light photography, and people who have seen our video tutorials know that we film our tutorials on location. So you'll see us work on locations in a number of different situations coming up. All right. All right. I'm going to stop over here and see if you guys have any questions. Any questions for me? Hello? So Karsten is asking, the light is changing so fast, how much time do you take to think about the photos <laughs> developing your idea? Yeah, so that's a, a critical portion of, um, of learning how to work with light. So a um, couple of things you have to be familiar with when you're working with light. One of the things I am gonna say is you have to be very, very uh, proficient at setting your exposure and focus. Now, exposure and focus are two things that are fairly easy to master because they have like finite amount of technical stuff. Um, you, can, you can do it to master those. What you have to develop when we are in the field, we're constantly thinking about creativity is what do I envision this location is like? And based on that, we will actually set up our cameras. So creativity is where we spend majority of the times in. Now, sometimes you can go and develop that creativity ahead of time. For example, when we were trying to photograph Aurora Borealis, we knew exactly what lenses we needed, what focus settings to use, what exposure settings to use. Then all we did was we went around trying to get a good composition out of the photo that you see. So the foreground is not as boring as just a night sky with aurora lights on it and stars. So Jay Leslie is asking, how do you expose to the clouds or a single light source? And she's saying, be specific. <laughs> I would love to Leslie, um, but that is actually an entire class in itself. But I will give you a couple of tips since you asked the question. Um, that depends on what you're trying to do. If you try to capture a backlight cloud, you have to look at the histograms. And based on the histograms, you can just decide what exposure setting to set. Now, if your histogram tells you that you're underexposing images or part of your image, then you end up falling back to bracketing. Now, if you don't know how to bracket or you're not comfortable or you don't want to, you can actually end up using a GND filter to control the light source in a cloud with a single exposure. But the GND filters don't always work and they do have drawbacks, all right? All right, so I think um, if you guys have any questions, um, you can just send me in the chat box, I'll try to respond, but I do wanna hand over and ask you guys a question. 
So next presenter can go in. So my next question to everybody here is, what is more challenging, nature photography or travel photography? What do you guys think? Come on. Anybody get any ideas? Not the presenters. I'm talking about people who are watching these presentations. What do you guys think? Portraiture. <laughs> yeah, well, I was not supposed to answer. Yeah. It depends. <laughs> Here's a politician here, nature photography, Leslie. Uh, it depends. Actually, it does depend, but I can tell you one thing about nature photography and travel photography that um, is true is I find travel photography more challenging because um, why is it? Because in nature photography, I have a choice of my subject matter. So if I go to a beach, I can take macro photos, I can shoot the birds, I can shoot the waves, I can shoot the sky, a lot of things. With travel photography, you're fixed with a subject, with a schedule, with light, with access, a lot of constraints on travel photography that nature photographers don't have. So I'll let Ugo explain. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I would also add that uh, travel photography can be more difficult because it's a, it's a genre that is quite difficult to, to define, to, to fit into a specific uh, subject. So when we, do, when we travel, we take photos of natural landscape, landscapes. We take photos of cityscapes, architecture, people, food, uh, macros, festivals, wildlife. So this, it's a bit of everything. And sometimes we don't get the luxury of, uh, of time. Like we want, you want to photograph a specific landscape. You want to go and photograph the, the volcanoes uh, and you can dedicate one week to photographing the, the rainforest. But if I go to, to Brazil, uh, I cannot afford to just spend one week photographing the rainforest. I have a, a ton of subjects to, to paint a, a complete and cohesive picture of maybe of a whole country, of, of a whole region. So this is what maybe in my opinion makes it kind of a, a bit more difficult. And I see here Greg is saying that sometimes you are often on someone else's schedule, which is definitely true. Sometimes I do travel photography when I'm traveling with family. So I have to <laughs> take account of their schedule. Uh, anyway, let, let me share my screen and maybe uh, talk a little bit about how I approach light in travel photography. Let me, let me know if you can see my, my slides here. Yep. Is it good? Yeah, it's good. Okay, so this is what we are going to talk about, working with light in travel photography. And Jay, you already mentioned some of the characteristics of light, and uh, we can talk about the, the quantity of light, how much light is uh, present in a scene. Uh, is it uh, very bright or is it very dark? Are we photographing at night or at noon? Uh, is it the color of light? Or is it where we're we photographing at the golden hour when the light is warm or we're we photographing uh, at night at the blue hour when the light is blue by definition? The direction of light, you already hinted at that, front light, back light, side light, and so on. And uh, the shape of light, which is something that is, uh, the trap, for example, portrait or studio photographers know how to control but uh, we're, in, we're in the field, we cannot control the shape. Here I refer to the fact that sometimes the light is harsh because it's a point light source like the direct sun. Other times it's uh, diffuse, like you have a cloudy day. So you have all of those factors to, to consider when deciding on how to expose and how to capture a photo. But of course, today we only have like uh, 10, 15 minutes to talk. So I'm just limiting myself to talk about quantity of light in this case. And of course, I invite everybody to my class on Sunday where I will be going over all those uh, other topics. So quantity of light, meaning how do we set our camera to capture the light depending on its quantity so that we are exposing correctly. And there are many ways to, to think about exposure. And uh, I'm uh, recently, came, went back to shooting film. And in film, we have this mantra, which is exposed for the shadows, developed for the highlights, which works with, with negative film because negative film has a very uh, high latitude of exposure. And especially you can uh, overexpose a lot, the highlights and still get some detail that you can recover while developing or printing. But 
uh, with with film with digital it's it's not that uh, it's not that good i mean digital is much more similar to slide film slide film or positive or reversal film is the type of film that we used and some people still do we used to shoot when we were on vacation with our film cameras and we were shooting slides and then instead of printing them we were subjecting our friends to or family to hours and hours of Oh, here's the slideshow of my vacation, and everybody was hating you for that. But yeah, slide film uh, is is a very uh, is a very limited dynamic range. You need to be very careful with your exposure. If you're overexposed or underexposed, you can basically throw the slide away. You can you need to be very careful. And in some respect, uh, digital uh, is similar to slide film in that the dynamic range is a bit smaller than that of negative film, probably not as small as slide film, but still limited. And uh, especially one characteristic of digital is that if you blow your highlights, you overexpose them and they're completely white. There is no chance of ever recovering any detail in a completely white sky or uh, water or bright subjects. So you need to be to pay attention to your highlights and not only to your shadows, but also to your highlights. So uh, let, let me show you a couple of examples here of what I mean when I say exposing for the shadows or exposing for the highlights. So yeah, uh, this is one example where I was shooting this scene and this particular exposure, I was exposing for the shadows. What does it mean? It means that the areas that are in the shadow, and basically that's everything that is in the foreground, those rocks, and this, the back of this uh, castle, which was backlit. By the way, brownie points for every, anyone who recognizes this uh, ruin, which was featured in a movie from, I think it was from the 1980s. Let me know if you recognize it. Uh, anyway, this uh, if you can see from the histogram there that the left peak represents the, the, the parts of the image that are in the shade, so the rocks and the castle. And it's a very nice histogram. Uh, it's uh, everything is contained within the, uh, the, it's in the shadows, but it's still bright enough to have uh, discernible detail, whereas the sky is basically blown out. There's very little color. Everything that is under the sun is basically blown out and there's not a lot we can do to recover that in post. Conversely, this is a photo that was exposed for the shadows, for, uh, sorry, for the highlights. I, was sh I made sure that I exposed so that I got enough color in the sky. I wanted that nice blue color in the sky. This image is not, not post-processed at all. This is straight out of camera just to show you how it looks. And as you can see, the histogram is very much pushed to the left and uh, there is very little detail in the shadows and parts of it are actually completely black and completely unrecoverable. So in a situation like that, what is the correct exposure? Well, maybe it's something in the middle. Uh, we'll get back to this with more examples, but first let me, uh, discuss a little bit about what is the correct exposure and can we talk about a correct exposure in every situation? Well, uh, sometimes yes, but I what I would normally say is that there is no such thing as a correct exposure. There are certainly wrong exposures and maybe the, the two that we've seen previously are examples of wrong exposures, but how as to how to define a correct exposure, it's much more difficult. Let me give you my uh, personal opinion about this with, with an example. So this is an example where I purposefully decided to expose in a way that would preserve the color and the texture in the clouds in this uh, beautiful sunset over Loch Lomond in Scotland. And I decided that I wanted to preserve that color because that was the most impactful part of my photo. And I didn't care about the tree. The tree is an important part of the composition, but do I care that there is no detail in the tree? It's basically completely black and I don't see the color of the leaves. Well, you might disagree or agree or disagree with that, but what I'm basically saying that exposure is always an artistic choice. You can choose to expose for the shadows here and reveal the detail in the tree, enough color, or maybe more detail in the distant shore. 
But here I decided to expose for the sky and let the shadows go black. I don't really care about it. I care, I don't know if you can see it in zoom, might be difficult to see, but the distant shore, the hills there are not completely black. They still have some details, some light there because probably because of the reflection of the clouds. So there is some separation between the trunk of the tree and the distant shore. Uh, it makes it so that it's not completely mixed together. Uh, there is some uh, separation, which is nice, but still everything is very, very dark. And if I had let my camera decide on the exposure, I might have gotten a much brighter and lost a lot of the color uh, in the clouds. So that was my specific decision. I like to stop and think about how I want to expose for a scene like this. And in this case, decide maybe to um, uh, preserve the colors in the sky instead of the colors in the foreground. Uh, let me give you a few other examples. And I want to show you three uh, three particular examples, one, two, and three. And I would like to ask you, uh, I'm not seeing the chat, but I would like to ask the people here a question. The question is, uh, type your answer in the chat if you want. Consider these three photos and tell me what is the single most important thing that these photos have in common? Aside from composition and choice of subject, leave away the fact that I'm shooting into the sun or have silhouettes and stuff like that. But in terms of exposure and light, what is the defining, uh, the, the thing that these three photos have in common? Let me see if uh, anyone can come up with some ideas. There's Single this. strong light source, yeah. Negative space and shadows. Yeah, the shape of what is being silhouetted is important here, but it's not relevant for exposure. The, the, what is the exposure decision that I made here? So let me, let me tell you. Essentially, I went for intentional underexposure, and which is something that is typically you would not see in typical or traditional landscape photography. If these were landscape photos, you would want to see details in the foreground. You don't want to see a lot of black, a lot of silhouettes, right? But here we're talking about travel photography. What is my aim when I go to a place like the, the one on the right was shot on an island in Greece. And if you've ever been to Greece, especially to the Greek islands, you will immediately recognize the typical architecture of Greek churches with that open bell towers with the cross on top and the little dome. That to me speaks Greece. That's a typical Greek scene. And do I need to show the detail in the, in the front of that church? Well, you might disagree again, but in my opinion, I don't need to. I want to show enough texture in the sea on the right to actually see a little bit of the waves. It's not, I don't want that to be completely black. But as for the foreground, I'm happy with that. And I'm happy to underexpose. I underexpose maybe two or three stops here to get a very strong geometric subject that is characteristic of that specific region of the world. Uh, same with the, the one in the center, which was taken in Thailand. And if you've been to Thailand, you might recognize the typical architecture of the stupa of a Buddhist temple in Thailand. And this is all, all you need to understand what the subject is, if you're familiar with it. On the left, it's a bit more generic, but that, that ship is, is a very strong shape when it's aligned with the sun. And do I need to see detail there? I don't think so. So in this case, it's in order to preserve the colors and to have that very strong silhouettes and geometric shapes, I purposely decided to underexpose a lot of those shots. Uh, let's look at a different example going completely the opposite direction here. And uh, look at this histogram. And if you just see the histogram and you were has to judge about the exposure of the photo looking at the histogram alone, you might think that this is badly overexposed. There is almost no pixels in the shadows. And there's a lot of uh, the, the, the yellows and the reds are very, very bright, almost at the limit of the, the range of exposure. You might think this is badly overexposed. But if you actually look at the photo, this is the corresponding, this is the histogram for this photo. And uh, in this case, I, I did the opposite decision here because this is a scene from um, early morning, just before 
right at sunrise in the hills of Tuscany in the fall. And with its typical for the fog to linger at the bottom of the valleys and create these beautiful pastel colors in the, in the hills and the sky. And this reminds me a lot of the, some of the Renaissance paintings and uh, actually some of the most famous Renaissance painters actually painted these very landscapes that I was photographing here. So I wanted that kind of feeling very airy, very bright, very uh, serene. So I decided to expose very much to the right, being careful about not blowing out the highlights, but still leaving very little in the shadows, if not in, the, in these little bits of the, of the image that are like those dark cypress trees, which are naturally dark. Uh, another example here, I don't have a histogram, but you can imagine how it would look like. This is the island of Eos in Greece again, shot across the sea on a, an evening right after sunset. And I love the beautiful pastel colors of the sky and the fact that there was some, a lot of haze across the sea, making it a bit misty. I shot it with a long telephoto. Actually, most of the landscape that you've seen before were shot with a telephoto, not with a wide angle. And I decided that I wanted that bright pastel colors again and exposing, overexposing. Uh, if I had let the camera decide, it might have given me a much darker scene, but I didn't want that. Or another early morning scene in, in winter in Norway, uh, a lot of bright colors, white snow, pastel sky and clouds and fog. Again, very, the histogram here is very much pushed to the right. There is a little bit of shadows where there are dark portions here. But again, if I let the camera decide, uh, that would have probably given me a much darker exposure. So once the camera decides you to, the camera has a mind of its own, right? The camera will, if let it to its own device, would uh, decide on what exposure it wants and give you like a average exposure. But how do you fix that? On the, on the scene. Well, so how do you fix the exposure? Well, one my, my favorite uh, tip that I can give to you is to learn to use your exposure compensation control in the camera. Uh, well, of course you can shoot manual. Um, I, uh, manual is, is fine. I mean, you can control everything when you're shooting in manual and decide on the exposure with total freedom. I'm a bit of a lazy guy. And if I'm traveling, sometimes I'm uh, uh, on a on-the-go situation. So I like to use uh, automation in my camera, like using aperture priority as much as I can. But I like using exposure compensation to make my photos darker or brighter depending on the circumstances. So depending on my conscious artistic decision to what kind of feeling I want, what kind of emotion I want my photo to convey. So I'm happy that my... Fujifilm camera have a very prominent exposure compensation wheel on top, where not only I can access it easily with my thumb, but even if the camera is turned off, I can look at the top of the camera and see how it's set. Uh, I think Sony has the same type of control. Uh, if you're shooting Nikon, they tend to make it a little bit more obscure because they have this little plus minus bind minuscule button that you have to press. And while you keep it pressed, you need to turn one of the wheels. So it, it's like they don't think exposure compensation is very important. But to me, it's uh, probably the most important, together with aperture, the most important control in a camera. So my recommendation, if you are not keen on using manual mode, learn to use a master exposure compensation to drive your um, exposure decisions and react to, to light and own the, the light, not be uh, owned by the light. And then another tip is, and, and here to be honest, I have to, to make a confession because I, mean, I don't always make those decisions on the on, in the field and get it always right in camera. Sometimes I want to, to have options later. My process involves deciding on exposure at the moment of shooting, but also processing the photo at the computer or in the wet darkroom to make it look like I want to make it look. So I want to have more options. So what I do is, I mean, I bracket. I'm happy with bracketing whenever I can. And if you thought that the first photos that I showed you was 
yeah, nailed perfectly first shot. Well, I have to, sorry to disappoint you, but I did a five uh, exposure bracket there. Then I choose, I chose one of the five, the one that had the better uh, histogram, and then I developed that one. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's how I operate. Um, think uh, I have a, I see a question here about using graduated neutral density filter. Let me maybe show you. Uh, yeah, I sometimes I do use a GND filter. Uh, and it's, uh, I think Jay, you, you said that at the beginning, right? GND filters are great. If, especially if you want to control the contrast and not do bracketing in camera, yep. they're, they're very good. They have their limitations, uh, depending on the type of filter, uh, the, how do you call this, say the, the depth, I mean, the, the amount of stops that it blocks at the top part can vary. So it might not be enough or it might be too much. The border between the, the dark part and the bright part might be too abrupt or too soft. And sometimes like in this, I mean, I took this photograph obviously in Venice and if I wanted to photograph this panorama of Venice with a GND filter, I would have the issue of the bell tower of St. Mark's Basilica sticking over the horizon. And if I use the GND filter on top of that, I would darken half of the, of the bell tower. So sometimes if you have a, a nice straight uh, regular horizon, a GND filter is good. Otherwise it might have its own uh, set of uh, issues. Yeah, so uh, you know how, how, how am I doing with time? You're over time, so you want to stop at this point? Yeah, um, I think I'm done. If there are still some, a few minutes for questions, happy to, to take them. Otherwise, I would invite everybody to yeah, come to my uh, workshop on Sunday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, where we will be talking about all of this and more. All right, so let me, um, now that you guys know about travel photography, let's ask a question. Let's say, for example, what if you guys can't travel? What if you don't want to travel? What if you're a homebody or say you're in the middle of a pandemic? Well, the answer is pretty simple. If I'm in the middle of pandemic and I want to take photos, the only person I contact is Alan Shapiro. So there you go, Alan, it's all yours. I will stop talking. No, you don't know how to stop talking, but here's what <laughs> I need everybody to do. Because for the first part of my presentation, I just need you to look at me and like what's behind me because I'm gonna use, I'm here at home because we're living through a pandemic. Fortunately, it feels like for some of us, we're coming through it and we've all made it because we're all here. Um, I have two classes coming up on Saturday. The first one is working with studio lighting, which by the way is a misnomer because I can take my studio lights and I can go to a garden if the conditions aren't right. The next one is a changing, enhancing lighting in Adobe Lightroom, who I've been working with since 2002, actually before, because I was one of the beta testers before they even came out. I just love Lightroom because it's sort of all inclusive, but let me take a step back. So I shoot food and flowers and portraits, but nobody cares about portraits because here we are in visual wilderness. So we're gonna talk about more the pretty stuff in nature. I shoot for clients and I shoot for myself and my clients I shoot for because it's about money and feeding the gear habit that I have. For myself, it's not about making money, it's about making me smile because photography is therapeutic, it's relaxing. With clients, it's about giving them something that they expect. They've given me a layout, they've seen something of mine that they want me to replicate. So consistency and precision and knowing how to do whatever they're looking for, no matter what the conditions is really important. When I'm shooting for myself, it's just about serendipity. So I care a little bit less, but I may wanna be practicing. I may wanna be teaching myself things. Um, with clients, it's about being efficient because there's usually a deadline. You know, uh, Audubon or Horticulture Magazine calls me up or ABC Television or Apple calls me up and says, we need a picture of fill in the blank, this flower. And we want it to be inside or outside, doesn't matter. 
and we need it in two days. Now I look at the weather because do I want to go to a garden or do I want to run to my local flower market here in New York and pick something up? But I need to be able to fit it into my schedule. So the first thing I do, if it's um, bad weather or if I want to shoot at night, is I have to be able to control the light myself. So I'm going to zoom way back and hopefully you can see what's going on here. I have, can you, can you see things, Jay? I don't know. Yep, yep okay. we can see it. So I have a whole bunch of lights. This happens to be a tiny LED light, which means it's continuous tone with a, uh, a parabolic diffuser on it. Now, why do I want that versus, say, a Fresnel with barn doors? Totally different kind of light versus an aluminum focusing grid, sometimes called the snoot, but in this case, it's really just, you know, for casting light, versus I have a flat panel over here. These are all bicolor lights. I have a tube light over here. These are all kinds of crazy different tools that I use kind of every day, every week, depending on what I'm needing to shoot. But we do not have all of these. So I'm going to show you how I work with them. But I'm also going to show you how to work with things like tin foil and tissue paper. Because I grew up at a time where there was this show called MacGyver. And he could make things out of ordinary objects that resulted in very simple solutions to what could be very expensive kind of thing. So when I'm on location, I carry a pen light a very tiny pen light because I may be shooting things in the middle of a very shaded garden and yet I want to draw attention to the center of the flower. So I'll use this. But if you look at this, it's really bright. So now all I have to do is tear off a piece of tissue paper and put a few layers of tissue paper in front of it. And now I have a very beautiful diffused soft light source. So that's the lighting course. And I could talk ad nauseum about it, but you really, if you have any interest in studio lighting on location or in the studio on Saturday, I'm going to have this all set up and I'm going to do it in a much more organized fashion. So we're going to talk about each light and what each one does and what it doesn't do and how I use it in my workflow because, you know, I have been doing this for a while and and hopefully you'll, you'll get a sense of how you can work with ordinary objects in your house. You may just have a house lamp. I mean, I don't know, hopefully a lot of you are, you know, you've got your strobes, but I'm gonna show you the benefits of continuous light. And later on, I'll do a strobe course because there's a very different use for me, right? Yep. And so that's class one. If there are any questions, I want to, there's not much I can show you here in the time allotted, but I'm going to do a deep dive. It'll be a 90 minute course and there'll probably be another one after that. So if you have any interest, it's going to be very high level. It is going to be all about LED lights, working with reflectors and whatever. A lot of the principles apply to uh, strobe lighting as well. So I don't want you to think you're not going to get anything from it. I just happen to prefer in my home studio, which is where I am, you know, uh, a more informal way. And so if I can't sleep and it's two in the morning and the sun isn't light shining because you can see I've got a wall of beautiful northern exposure light, so it's perfect for ambient shooting. But if it's nighttime and I have to meet a deadline or I just want to play with a new technique, you better know how to work with the lights and the modifiers and all the, the tools behind you. So that's course one. Now I'm going to share because I want to go to course number two, which is about Lightroom. God, I love Lightroom. Can you see my screen, everybody? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to do what photographers hate doing. I'm going to show you sort of befores and afters. So I want to show you where I started. Whoops, hang on, bear with me. Why isn't it doing that? This one doesn't want to do a before and after. 
But anyway, so let me try it one more time. I guess I can do this. I guess I can just hit reset. There's a, so here's the original shot out of camera. Now I'm a Fuji shooter mirrorless. This is the raw file that gives me all sorts of information that I can work with and manipulate. But on, a, on this particular day, it was cloudy. So there wasn't a lot of contrast. Cloudy is good for nature photographers, particularly when we're out and about. Um, but it's not what I wanted. It might not have been what the client wanted. So let's see, we're gonna undo that and we're gonna go back to where we were. For some reason, I'm not able to, there we go. So this is what I wanted. So you can see, I warmed it up, I brightened it up. We're not gonna talk about basic exposure settings per se, although that'll be part of the workflow that I'm gonna show you. But some of the decisions we make when we go from Here's the source file to why did I do what I did and what it, so in some cases it's because the light wasn't doing what I wanted it to do on location. So I know that that is not necessarily a deal breaker. I can come back home and I can do very dramatic things if I'm so inclined and I just wanna push the creative bounds of post-processing or if my clients are looking for a warm sundowny time and the only time I could get to this particular garden to shoot exactly what they wanted was during twilight so it was cool, I know I can fix it. So the question is if you're working for yourself or if you're working for clients and, they, and you wanna to get to a certain thing, do you know how to do it? So there are lots of tools we can work with beyond basic white balance shifts. You've got working in tone curves, which is one of my favorite things. And I'm gonna make it real easy for you to understand it. You've got playing with the hue and the luminance values because it's less about saturation, but certainly I can take, I can take a cool shot and warm up specific things without shifting things overall, just using my color uh, controls. I can certainly go into color grading and I can make some, some things happen there. The question is, do you know when and where to use each of them? So again, before and after, more befores, here's after. I'm sorry, here's before. So I chose these particular ones because, you know, the, the weather wasn't cooperating per se. In some cases, I was out and I was not in a place where I could bring lights because sometimes if I'm in a private garden or whatever, they, they you know, frown on people coming in with big light stands and whatever. So you have to know how to do certain things. So let me keep flipping through so you can see uh, a little bit of magic. And I'm gonna end, so here is, here's the original. Oh, again, a flat raw file. I wanted to make it a little bit more, you know, the, the sun is just coming up. Let's see, is it blue hour? Yeah, kind of. But again, the, I'm not trying to emulate real time per se, although some of you may want to, and certainly you can apply the principles I will be sharing on Saturday toward making things realistic. But in my practice and my workflow and my clients, they want things that are a little bit more colorful and a little bit more attention getting, which brings up a whole other kind of conversation is how do you stand out? There are lots of people who shoot flowers. There are lots of people who shoot landscapes and travel photography. Do you have, do you have something that um, you either become known for one or that is distinctive and, and appealing to a group of people. I mean, the last thing we all wanna do is make more Instagram-like photos. So I'm gonna take you to an image as a starting point. This was part of a, let's see, I'm, I'm helping Nikon launch a new lens as we speak, literally it was announced last week. This is one of the experimental shots. And then they said, well, could you, you know, can you apply your look to it? It's like, what does that mean? What I, I hope I don't have a look, but if I do, you know, so then I start showing them, you know, well, but it could look like this. It could be kind of soft and misty, or it can be like this, a little bit more dramatic, you know, so the light's going down. 
or it can be like this, a little bit more muted and subdued. I mean, we've all seen the weather change as different clouds roll in and the sun is at different parts, times of the, of the you know, different parts of the sky. So I'm gonna stop kind of here and just show you that, you know, you, if you take the class on Saturday, you'll have a pretty good jump start on how to do and change the lighting in your images. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and see if there are any questions. All right, guys, any questions for Alan? I hate this part. I feel that, like so there was a guy. there was a class question about what time is your class, and um, I answered that. So, just uh, um, anybody else have any questions? If not, um, I would highly recommend showing up on Saturday if you guys have time, uh, or if you don't have time, you can always watch it afterwards because Ellen's magic is uh, awesome. All right, um, let's continue since we are pressed for time. So Alan works with, so I'm share my screen again. Alan works with um, Lightroom. Well, what about people who work with Photoshop? Like I don't work with Lightroom. I, would, I know how to use Lightroom, but I usually end up getting lost. So for those you, who Jay, do- you gotta, you gotta pay more attention. <laughs> I should take your class. Yeah, for those of you who do work in uh, Photoshop, I am going to turn it over to Kate to see how incredibly easy it is to get away with what you want. Get away with what I want? Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, get away with what the photographer wants. Uh, I know, I know what you mean. <laughs> anyway, right. hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. And uh, thank you for, for sticking around. I, I hope this isn't going to be too long. Uh, mine will be pretty short and sweet. It's going to be like five, six minutes. Um, so let me share my screen. There we go. And can we see Keynote? Yeah. All right. Awesome. Okay, um, my, uh, you know, everybody's teaching a class next weekend. I'm not going to be one of them. Uh, I am going to be teaching an in-person workshop next weekend. So my class has been uh, recorded and uploaded to uh, Jay's website there at Visual Wilderness. So um, I'm sure he will have some information for you with regarding that. Um, right now I'm going to discuss balancing light in Photoshop. Yes, Photoshop. I know, not everybody's a fan, but hopefully you will be uh, uh, later on. Um, as landscape photographers, we have to, you know, contend with nature, clearly. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I, I don't, I hate bugs. <laughs> I don't deal well <laughs> with cold or humidity, and I'm not even a fan of excessive heat. So, but I can deal with all of that. Okay, but what about the light? What happens when the light uh, doesn't cooperate? Because, you know, I went out and I just, uh, I didn't get what I wanted. So, you know, nature, sometimes she just doesn't play nice. I'm sorry, we have to work with it. Um, sometimes I get this insane backlighting that makes my camera freak out. Sometimes a car drives through my perfectly good night scene and ruins it for me. Sometimes I get uh, annoying, broken, dappled light. Uh, sometimes I get light that just doesn't blow my skirt up. Uh, sometimes I get some unflattering light. It's a jacket and, and hip pouches, I swear. Um, and sometimes I get the, I'm about to get rained on, and, but I got a really cool rainbow out of it kind of light. So the, what are we gonna do? Um, you know, we don't always get what we want. So how do we deal all of this? How do we take the mundane and make it spectacular? How do we deal with dull light or harsh light, contrasty light? Uh, we are going to open it up in Photoshop. We're going to take the good, bad, and the truly ugly, and we are going to try and make it beautiful.
Okay. So a question that I get quite a bit is, uh, you know, Kate, Kate, why, oh, why do I have to use Photoshop? <laughs> you don't have to, uh, but there's lots of benefits from it. Um, you get to put uh, adjustments in their own individual layers, which allows you to come back and make changes to just one thing that you did, not the entire image as a whole, which brings me to layer masks, which allow you to uh, limit where that adjustment goes within an if within an image. You can make selections of your foreground, your background, your sky, uh, little bits and pieces and, and put them together. And you can use actions that help speed up your workflow. Uh, the beautiful part is that you get to save these layers for use in the future. And I have gone back to images that I took eight, 10 years ago and had to bring them back into Photoshop and change something on one particular layer. And you are not relying on algorithms to blend your images together. You're gonna to do that uh, on your own. And of course, you know, Photoshop is super fun and totally easy. Okay, that is not entirely accurate, but I can help you with that. Okay, so sometimes we go out in the field and we get the light that we want, yay. Uh, but sometimes even when we do get what we want, you know, I'm picky, you know, I still wanna change it. So, uh, you know, overcast light is great for foliage and for water, but it does tend to kind of dull the image. And so we have to take things into uh, Photoshop and, and, you know, work can be done in Lightroom as well. And we are going to discuss the whole uh, Lightroom to Photoshop workflow as well. So you can really make it a part of your overall photo editing experience. Um, but Photoshop will allow me to, to go in and say I wanted to just make a selection of the water itself and make it less blue and a little bit more white. I can do that uh, within Photoshop. And we can just make that whole image pop. Okay, sometimes I want to expose uh, for my foreground and I want an exposure for the midground, and I want an exposure just for the springs and one more just for the sky. And I want to put all these together. And yes, Lightroom can merge these to HDR uh, within Lightroom. But you know, what if I just want this one piece of the spring right here and not uh, you know, the surrounding area? That's not something that Lightroom is going to be able to pick out. Uh, so I have to bring that type of stuff into Photoshop and manually blend those bits and pieces together to get exactly what I want. So I'm going to uh, jump into Photoshop here just for a second and show you a little bit about what you're going to see in this video series. Uh, so I'm going to make a, uh, a selection here. And selections can be really simple or they can be very, very complex. So what I'm going to go do is I'm going to go select color range and I'm going to click on the sky. And I'm going to hold the shift key and click on different parts of the sky. So I make sure that I'm getting most of it. And wait till you see when this is done, the type of selection that I did in a matter of a few seconds. Whoa, that's a crazy selection. So from here, I can make any adjustment to that sky that I want. So I'm going to grab hue saturation just so we can all see things very easily. And I'm going to crank it up and make it look horrible. But anyway, uh, just wanted to show you how that can select just a portion of the image. I can make that background kind of black and white and do all sorts of things to it. And I can even, if I wanted to, let's see, add another, oops. Add another layer. Let's do a photo filter and let's clip it to that layer and warm the background. Or let's uh, let's underwater that black background. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that looks kind of ridiculous. So we're going to go back to Keynote and I'll show you the actual before and after that I got from that. So here's that original image and when you take the tools in Photoshop that allow you to make those complex selections, 
uh, you can really concentrate on separating foreground from background and creating more depth uh, and, and contrasting your image when you are left with kind of some dull light here. So we're going to go over those types of selections, layer masks, manual blending, uh, and so much more. So I do hope to, uh, to see you there. Uh, again, mine is recorded, so I, I guess I won't actually see you, but I hope you get some use out of it. And uh, okay, I'm ready for questions. Let me uh, stop sharing. There we go. All right, we don't have any questions. If there are any questions, you can answer in the chat box. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go ahead and um, start my screen share so we can talk about this. So okay. um, once you have uh, taken Kate's class and she's going to talk about balancing the light, um, then one of the things I have, we've never done this before, but we always hear is if we want somebody to teach us how to get started with luminosity mask. Now luminosity mask gives you an ultimate control over how you can blend images and adjust images. And the question we always had is it's really hard to use, right? But it's actually not true. Luminosity mask is really very easy to use once you know a couple of tricks. So don't listen to everything you hear on social media, right? And in order to prove that it isn't quite as difficult, I'm gonna turn it over to Austin Jackson. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about luminosity masks. Um, I'm actually just going to go ahead and share my screen here and pull up my presentation. Um, let's see. Okay. So I'm gonna be talking about luminosity masks. Um, can you see my screen right now? No. Give me... hmm. Let's see. My Zoom has been causing me some issues lately, of course. Just search out the whole screen rather than just the... Yeah. Just the application. Perfect. Okay, I just need to leave and rejoin really quick. I will be back in 30 seconds. All right. So while um, we're waiting for Austin, anybody has any questions? Um, there was a question for Kate. Um, Kate, do you want to answer um, answer that? Yeah, the question was, do I use any plugins to do selections uh, or do I create selections using tools just in Photoshop? And the answer is both. <laughs> um, I use uh, Photoshop tools for my more complex uh, selections, but I'll, you know, I'll go into Nick software, ColorFX Pro or SilverFX or something like that uh, in order to apply effects selectively using their control point uh, technology. So. Uh, definitely more than uh, one way to get something done <laughs> when it comes to photo editing. So, All right, so here, Austin's back. So Austin, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Sorry about that. Every time you update your computer, you've gotta like readjust things. So here we go. <laughs> Anyways, um, sorry about that, everybody. Um, I am going to be talking a little bit about luminosity masks for beginners. Uh, like Jay said, you have, may have heard that they're very complex and complicated, but they actually aren't. Um, it, they do take a little bit of time to learn on your own, but luckily I'm going to be here to walk you guys through exactly how to use them. Um, if you are a beginner and you've never used them before. So I'm going to learn all about luminosity masking. So first of all, what is a luminosity mask? Um, it's essentially a layer mask that's created by using the lightness values of the pixels in your image. So you can see on the left side, if you transform yourself back to the last time you used Photoshop, you may have used a layer mask. This mask on the left side, or this is an example of a mask that would have been created just using a brush. Whereas um, I have a mask like this one on the right is a luminosity mask. So when you're using masks in Photoshop, 
Remember that um, white reveals and black conceals. So this mask on the left here is very basic and simple. It would be something just like masking out a small part of the image, whereas on the right is what's called a luminosity mask. So we're actually making a selection of the lights in the image. And that image there you can see is black and white because it's just a black and white layer mask. But you'll see the image a little bit later in this presentation in color. And you'll see that what I've selected there is just what's the brightest in the image. So why should you use luminosity masks? Um, it is obviously one more thing you have to learn. You need to do it in Photoshop. And I know there's a lot of photographers out there that just don't like post-processing. But it's so important to use luminosity masks. So many pros are using it and amateurs as well. And the reason why luminosity masks are so nice is that they make creating selections in your image incredibly easy. So it's going to allow you to select things like the lightest spots in your image, such as the sun in the background, the bright clouds, uh, maybe a sunlight hitting a tree in your foreground. And then on the flip side, it's going to allow you to make great selections of those dark areas as well, such as some really deep shadows in the scene or, um, I mean, any, anything that's dark in the scene. I have, a lot of you guys may have shot landscapes before, and you know that a lot of times you've got a really bright sky and a really dark foreground. So luminosity masks really help you to fine tune and select those parts of the image to adjust them by themselves. Um, so also, they're really great for blending HDR exposure blends um, and to balance these out. So a lot of you guys may have been out there before. And like we've seen from in some of the past presentations, you see these other great photographers and they're taking multiple images to capture what they want in a scene. Um, and the reason why they're doing that is because if you just take one image, your sky is going to be too bright and your foreground is going to be too dark. And even though we can go into Lightroom and adjust those sliders, or we can go into Photoshop and adjust those sliders, it's simply not going to give us the same quality of image or look as good as it would have if you took multiple exposures. When you take those multiple exposures, you can use luminosity masks in order to help blend those exposures together so that you have the best of both images. So you've got a sky that's properly exposed and a foreground that's properly exposed. So, and then lastly, the other reason why you should lose lumin luminosity masking is that there's literally unlimited potential. Since a luminosity mask is just a layer mask, you can use it on pretty much anything that Photoshop has to offer, whether it's some kind of a blur, whether it's a dodge and burn layer, uh, whether it's a curves layer, a hue saturation layer, whatever it is, you can use a lumin luminosity mask on it. <clears throat> so in my course, we're going to talk about a little bit on how to use luminosity masks. Now, the really great thing about this is that I'm going to teach the course using a free uh, basic panel that allows you to create luminosity masks. This is the Tony Kuiper basic V6 panel, and you can pick that up on his website. Uh, I will give that, uh, that information where you can find that in the link and whatnot in my course. So that is really nice that you won't have to pay for a panel because there's tons of great panels out there and I highly recommend buying one that you really like. But when you're first learning, it's really nice to be able to just snag something for free to give it a go and see if you really like it. So I'm going to be teaching it using this panel. Um, and you can see that the panel does look quite a little daunting if you don't know exactly how it works. Um, you've got tons of different options. You can see you've got numbers one through six. You've got all these different things going on, but I'm going to walk you guys through exactly how to use all of the panel and what you're going to want to use it for. And then I'm going to show you guys a few case studies as well using that panel. So uh, what can luminosity masks do? As I mentioned before, they can help you merge multiple HDR exposures. Um, you can also apply precise local adjustments. So these give you a little bit more control than a basic slider that you'd use in Lightroom or Photoshop, because by using these local adjustments, you're selecting just certain parts of the image rather than the image as a whole. And you're not allowing the software to make the decision on what's a shadow, what's a highlight. You are making that decision yourself. So it gives you the ultimate amount of control. Um, it also allows you, what I really love using them for, is to create a layer mask using a luminosity mask for dodging and burning. So a lot of you guys may be getting in dodging and burning your photos. Uh, you might want to darken one particular spot and you're doing this with a brush. And it's really nice to have a luminosity mask because it makes it so you don't have to be so precise with the brush because that luminosity mask is going to help protect certain spots of the image. So one example that I think of all the time is that I'll be shooting a photo of a particular spot and there's one corner of a particular object. Maybe it's a rock that's dark and then there's some sunlight hitting the other side. So if I'm trying to darken the dark side of the rock, I can use that luminosity mask to select those darks so that I'm not bleeding over into the light parts of the image. And so that's just a really nice way to create a cleaner image in the end. And luminosity masks are really the key to me doing this. There's also so many more things that you can do with luminosity masks. We're going to get into it 
Um, my course is going to be an hour and a half long. So that's going to give us a ton of time to cover exactly how to use them and everything that they can do and how they're going to help you guys create better looking photos. So I've got a little image example here. Um, I'm not going to walk, get into Photoshop and get too much into it because there is a lot to talk about, but I just wanted to show you guys a before and after image. On the top is the raw image straight out of the camera, and on the bottom is the edited image. So I was able to achieve this look with a lot of luminosity masking, and um, because I have such a deep knowledge of luminosity masks, it was really just second nature to me to make these adjustments. So some of the things that I use luminosity masks for in this image, where I did a little bit of color adjustments to the highlights. So I used a light luminosity mask to select those clouds. And you saw that mask at the beginning of the presentation. I use that to adjust the colors. Um, I brought up the darks in the scene. Obviously you can see in my edited image, the darks have a lot more detail than they do in the raw image. I brought down the highlights a little bit to kind of balance it with the foreground. Um, I used a lights mask to dodge and burn as well. So I enhanced the glow in the sky by using this lights mask and I painted in some color and some light in the sky. And then I also created contrast in both the darks and the lights. And when I say that, that's different than just sliding a simple contrast slider because I've actually created a selection of the darks and I've created contrast in those darks. So the really, really darks would get darker, whereas the darks that are not quite as dark will get a little bit lighter. And this is a really difficult concept to wrap your head around until you actually see it happen in person. But this is something that is achievable by using a luminosity mask. So who is this course for? If you're sitting here and watching this and you're not sure if this course is for you, uh, this course is definitely for landscape photographers who have somewhat of a basic understanding of Photoshop. You don't need to know a ton about Photoshop, but it is helpful if you kind of understand layer masks just a little bit, uh, just because a luminosity mask is a little bit more advanced of a layer mask. Um, this is courses for amateur photographers who are ready to gain a lot of control over their post processing. I know this was a big step for me back when I was an amateur photographer was learning luminosity masks and it really opened the door to so many different things for me and I really consider that kind of the start of my professional career. Um, and lastly, this is just for photographers who want to create images with very high dynamic range. I know a lot of you guys might like to go out there like me and shoot great sunsets and sunrises. And those images have so much dynamic range because your foreground is really dark and your sky might be really light. So I really hope uh, to see you guys at that course. It's going to be at 1.30 p.m. Eastern on Sunday, uh, this next Sunday. So that's all I got. Um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But yeah, I hope to see you guys there. All right. Thanks, Austin. So that pretty much covers pretty nicely about what this course is about. I'm going to let you guys ask questions and I'm going to move on to the next part of our presenter, which is, there was a question that came up was, hey, do you have to use Photoshop and Lightroom? Well, are there any other options? Well, there are. Actually, you can do a lot of control of light in plugins and, um, Plugins like Nick, which have the U-Point technology, make it super easy to control light. And to talk about that, I'm going to turn this over to Padma Ingoa. All right. OK, let me know if you can see my screen. Yep. Go for All it. Right. OK, um, so I'll try to be as brief. I'm not known to be being very brief, but I'll try. <laughs> um, so anyway, my program is going to be Sculpting Light with Nick Plugins. Does not mean I didn't use any Lightroom or Photoshop. I used it at the bare minimum. Like for example, I just use a little bit of bal white balance adjustments and lens corrections and such in Lightroom. I take my images into Photoshop and then only because in case if I want to do any masking or something, you can go to Nick from Lightroom, but I usually don't do that. Now. What does that mean, uh, sculpting light? Uh, sometimes, you know, when you're at location, like everybody else is saying, the nature photographers, we all uh, experience it. You cannot just order light, right? You cannot just, uh, you know, pray to God and say that, okay, I, I actually created a photography God, but he just doesn't listen to me. <laughs> so um, I do my best to get what are the good image that I can get, but, I can make it much, much better in Photoshop or Nick or Lightroom or the combination, all of it. So in this course, I'm planning to show you how you can use Nick uh, to rescue some of the images to enha enhance the light in it. Um, now, why Nick? There are 
plenty of plugins out there. And I, myself, I use Topaz, I use Alien Skin, but 99% of my images go through NIC because I started using NIC, I think three months after I got my camera. That was a long time ago. And it has been around for 20 years or so, or 20, 25 years. Very, very easy to use. There is no effort in learning because it's, it's again, very easy, even easier than Lightroom. And there are a wide variety of uh, effects, presets that you can use. They say about 200 presets. And this is only color effects. The whole NIC suite has about eight uh, uh, programs in it. I will be talking about uh, Viveza and Color Effects Pro. Um, and then you can actually make a recipe, customize it uh, so that you can actually uh, have a, a uniform look if you would like. I'm not, I'm not into uniform looks. I'm more like an eclectic type. So I like to process my images case by case rather than a batch processing. And you, though Nick recently, about a year and a half, two years ago, um, uh, introduced non-destructive editing, which they have taken a, a step further in the recent um, uh, upgrade. And you can also do uh, either global adjustments or you can localize your adjustments with ease. So I'm going to talk about each uh, uh, use case here. I have about four use cases. Uh, the first one is a silhouette it is shot around the sunset. I have a uh, Lee 10, uh, 10 stopper on it. So it has kind of a blue cast on it. So what I can do at this point is I look at this image and I said, oh, what can I do to make this better? And I say, evaluate this. And I said, I, I need more light on the, on the dock. But see, if on location, if I were to use, uh, say, uh, the exposure compensation, then I'm going to blow out uh, the colors in the water and in the sky. So I wanted to keep it uh, underexposed probably by about a, a stop under. But I took it to Nick after doing the basic adjustments in Lightroom. And I used this, um, this is Lightroom uh, color effects. I added these filters about four or five of those. First one is pro contrast. Any landscape photographer who uses Nick uh, color effects the very first filter that you go to is Pro Contrast. Ask anybody who is a snack and who's been using it for years and years. Pro Can Contrast is one of the best contrast um, uh, adjustment sliders that you can use. There are a few on the right-hand side that I'm, I'm gonna show you uh, actually from beginning to the end workflow of this use case. I just wanted to show you what I ended up with. Right here, if you see, I had um, lightened up the, uh, the dock a little bit and I reduced the color cast of uh, the blue color cast in the uh, sky a little bit and I added a more uh, glow. So I used brilliance and warmth, pro contrast, and I, I added a little bit of vignetting. All of that was done in neck. All I used Photoshop is for, is, you know, sometimes when you, uh, when you bring it back into Photoshop from neck and you say that that effect is a little too much, either I reduce the opacity or I brush out the Nick effect that I don't want to see in certain places. So, and the next use case is going to be for, oh, am I going at all anywhere? Sorry. So I was, in, I was gonna ask you, are you showing your screen because I'm only seeing a yeah. presentation. I am so sorry. Oh, yo, yo. <laughs> That's fine. I'm using double screens. I'm so sorry about it. Okay, so this is my before picture. And these are what I used, uh, pro contrast, sunlight, reflector effects. These are the five filters that I used, but not all of them used at 100% opacity. And I used Photoshop, but only to use the layer masks to selectively paint in the Nick effect. And this is my end image, okay? And the next uh, case study is, um, this is a Lotus that I shot in the middle of the day. And, uh, you know, these gardens are not open during the daytime uh, in the first thing in the morning or in the later in the evening. This is in DC. I have to drive three hours to go there. So I, the only time that I can shoot is when they're open. So I was there around 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And I used my long lens, uh, 100, 400, 100 to 400 lens, because these are all in the water. So I have to be at the edge of the water shooting into the sun. And so the only way that I like to shoot um, in the midday is to use that for side lighting or the back lighting. But for me, it is still kind of not there the way that I want it. So I took this into uh, Viveza and then added a little bit of uh, uh, color to it. 
and I went, took it into color effects and added sunlight reflective effects. Again, I'm going to walk, walk you through the workflow and that's what I ended up with. So what I try to do is I try to uh, darken the background. I try to add more light to the uh, flower. I try to uh, make the background, the bud in the background a little bit more prominent all using milk. So don't let harsh light um, conditions stop you from photographing. You just need to know how to get better at post-processing so you can still shoot during the daytime. And uh, this is another image during, uh, done or uh, like, you know, during a overcast day. So it's like evenly lit, but it's kind of, in my opinion, use a little bit more uh, shift in lighting, just a bit, not much. So I took it into, again, Nick color effects. I used polarization uh, preset. I used a dark and light and center. And I also used the pro contrast. Again, I used Photoshop for layer masks only. And I ended up with this. What did I do here? I basically uh, got the greens to pop. I added a little bit more light to the flower here and uh, did not do a lot. I added a lot more contrast to it because the rocks usually are there just to support the image for me, just to set the scene, but I don't need to see a lot of details in the rocks. I just wanted the greens and the whites and the flower to pop. So again, this is artistic vision that is personal to you. After you process it, and if you're not happy, you can just go back and create five different looks. And that is the freedom that you have in Nick without spending hours and hours in Photoshop learning all those techniques. And I have two more images just to quickly show you. And this is an image uh, for waterfall, um, overcast again, but my sun is kind of, uh, you know, has no definition in it. And uh, the greens don't look as great. So I took it into uh, Viveza and I said, okay, uh, water. What I, I want cool tones in the water because uh, the water inherently has some kind of bluish tone in it. And I wanted to enhance the greens and added, I uh, wanted to add a little bit of structure to it. And then I took this into uh, color effects and then added a tonal contrast. It is excellent preset to bring out the details in the sky. And then of course, to increase overall contrast, I use a pro contrast. And then I used a vignette lens in uh, color effects to give overall vignetting. So now you see how the sky popped with all the details. And by the way, you can also use the tonal contrast to reduce the contrast. I'm going to show you later in the next image and see how the greens popped. And then you have a little bit of a bluish cast in the uh, water um, because that inherently in the original image, there is a little bit blue cast in it. And uh, it just um, it shows that it is pure water in my opinion, when the water has yellow color cast in it, for me, it like just gives me that dirty kind of uh, look. Okay, and the next image is uh, the rose that I shot on a light box. I do a lot of light box image and I actually taught uh, two classes on visual wilderness. If you can go to my page, you can see my courses. I specialize in it. This is out of the box with all the spots and all, right? And um, what I, when I teach flowers, I tell people that don't go for contrast. Don't think that sharpness is important. It is not. Flowers are to be treated like, uh, you know, like poetry or like great melodies where, you know, you, you, don't, you don't treat flowers like hard rock, metal. Um, it's the same way for me, um, sharpness is not as important as overall feeling of it. When I look at this, I need to get the peaceful, divine kind of feeling. So I took it into um, uh, 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 color effects. I use the white neutralizer to neutralize the yellows and the whites. I use the tonal contrast to soften the overall contrast in mid-tones and shadows. So tonal contrast can be used for both pumping up the contrast or softening the image overall. I added a little bit of uh, glamour glow and I use a sunlight filter. And I'm going to show you how sunlight filter actually changes uh, the image quite a bit. And so this is what I ended up with. Um, this I printed on a uh, nice uh, metal. Um, uh, I got a metal print from Bay Photo and it looks beautiful. And um, so again, 
you can use NIC filters with, um, you know, like with ease. You don't need to spend hours and hours in Photoshop. So my class on Saturday is at 3.30. And if you can join or it can be recorded and you can view it later, I will be talking about at least four images um, start to finish how to do in NIC. That's it, back to you, Jay. All right, any questions for Padma? But mine is about four classes on visual wilderness. Um, so um, if you guys want, you can check out her page. I think I put a link on it about all the classes that are offered. So um, just to remind everybody that Ellen has two classes on Saturday. I have one on Sunday. Padma has one on Saturday. Austin and Ugo have one each on Sunday. So if you guys want to join us live, great. If not, you'll get access to all the recorded sessions. Kate does not have a class, but she's actually recorded her entire tutorial with a super high resolution uh, screen. So it's already available for download. Um, it has some phenomenal case studies from some awesome locations. So um, if you guys have any questions, let us know. Um, otherwise, we hope to see you guys there. <laughs> all right. Thanks. So, Thanks, all right. So, one of the things that people ask is Is Nick supporting Fuji RAW files? Alan, do you know anything about it? They are. <clears throat> they are? The they DxO are. Yeah. RAW? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, guys, just wanted to let you know because somebody commented that, hey, he's disappointed that Nick doesn't support RAW files. Mm, new version out, I think, two days ago or whatever. It's there. Awesome. Thank you. All right, guys. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, we'll see you guys. I'll send out the recording to everybody. So have a great weekend Bye. or have a great Monday. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>